are protected. Okay, so last week uh, we had the brothers all coming together. Joseph uh, got them to uh, end up bringing their brother Benjamin down. And Joseph is still trying, at least according to the, the standard and understanding, to really take the measure of his brothers. Are they the same, the same men who were prepared to sell him into slavery or not? And so uh, he arranges for a, a cup, a wine goblet, to be placed in the pack of, of grain that Benjamin is taking back to Canaan and then sends after him, and uh, they uh, take up the, the messengers, come up to the brothers and uh, find the missing cup in the bag of Benjamin. And so Joseph says, he, or through his agent, is that he's going to become, uh, have to be punished for it. And uh, so the brothers stick up for him, and Judah tries to protect him. And in the beginning of this week's Torah portion, Judah really tries to, to, to lay it in to Joseph and really blaming Joseph for causing the danger to his brother, uh, to Benjamin, Benjamin, Benjamin. And so Joseph now realizes that these are not the same men who had cast him into the pit. They're willing to risk their lives to their brother. And, and just like Joseph, he was the brother, he, he, he was the son, the child of Rachel. Uh, and therefore, he was, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the jealousy that naturally comes about when, when one's uh, wife is preferred over the others. That's one of the reasons why polygamy is never a good idea. Um, as a matter of fact, in the Talmud, uh, there's a whole discussion about when uh, a man dies childless, and if he has more than one wife, the co-wives in Hebrew are called sorim, enemies, trouble. It's interesting. That's the language that is, is used, because it's going to be tzorot. Uh, so anyway, uh, so he reveals himself. The brother's a little nervous and, and what have you, and he sends to... Uh, bring Jacob down to Egypt, and that transpires. Uh, and uh, when they get there, Joseph says, tell everybody uh, that uh, you are shepherds because the G Egyptians don't like shepherds, and that way they'll keep apart in the land of Goshen, away from the rest of the Egyptians. Uh, and uh, he tries to, to protect his family from being lost that way. The very end of the Torah portion is a fascinating story. Uh, whether it's historically accurate is irrelevant because it is historical. I'll explain in a moment why. At the very end of the Torah portion, in the end of chapter uh, 47, we are told that you know the famine is going on. There's no bread in the world. Uh, and even in Egypt, uh, the people were running out of money to pay for provisions that they were buying from the grain that had been collected in the years before. Right? It wasn't collected for them; it was collected for Paro. Right? It was his his grain. Uh, so the the Egyptians said to Joseph, to Joseph, right? Joseph is in charge. Give us bread, lest we die before your very eyes. So Joseph says, because you know, we don't have any more money, he says, bring your livestock and I will sell it against your livestock. And they brought the livestock. And when that was gone, he says, we, we, we're, we have no money. We have no animals. Uh, we have nothing but our persons and our farmland. Let us not perish. Take us in our land in exchange for bread and we with our land will be serfs to Paro. Provide the seed we may live and not die. The land may not come away. So Joseph gained possession of all the farmland of Egypt for Paro every Egyptian having sold his field because of the famine. And he removed the population town by town, whatever. So Joe's, it's not, the, the, the Bible, the Torah, makes it clear that it's not Paro's actual doing, although Joseph is acting for Paro, obviously, and if Paro wasn't happy, he would have said something. But Joseph is the middleman. And in the 17th century, in Poland and Ukraine, 
there were large estates owned by the Polish nobility. And the, the local population, of Ukrainian uh, uh, often, uh, were relatively poor. Who And it was up to the Jewish uh, Bailey, not Bailey, but, but R and R. I don't. I can't think of the English word for an R. He's not a magistrate. He's, he's an overseer mm -hmm. of the plantation, if you might mm -hmm. pardon the the combination of words. It, it wasn't exactly that, but he was he was a go between. So, for example, if you wanted to have a wedding, you had to buy a certain amount of alcohol from the uh, noble. Who sold it to you? The Jew. Hmm. You wanted to, to use your church? You get the keys from the nobleman. Who was the in-between going? The Jew. So in 1648, when the Tachvatat riots, the Ukrainians revolted against their Polish overlords, and they also took it out on the Jews. And and to be fair to the, the Polish uh, peasant, he saw the Jew identified with the guy who's oppressing him. So Jews getting caught in the middle is not unusual in history. The Jews didn't do it because they were necessarily bad. It was a job or something. Somebody had to do it, and they were willing to do it. They'd be the go-betweens. Uh, and you have that repeated a number of times in history. Uh, and, and it's always the case uh, when the Bolsheviks started up, uh, there were a lot of Jews who were mixed in with the Communist Party. Right? They felt it was the best for them. And they even turned against their fellow Jews. As well. But all right, so who are, the, who are the Bolsheviks? They're all Jews. No matter what they were, right? They were all Jews. Who are the capitalists? Well, there's Rothschild mm -hmm. and Baron de Hirsch, men who had lots of money, who happened to be Jewish. So all the capitalists were what? Jewish. So it didn't make any difference. Either you were communists and the capital and the white Russians would kill you, or you were a capitalist and the red Russians would kill you. It, 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 it's like, and I'll finish with one joke. I know uh, I have to have jokes. Mm -hmm. uh, during the the worst of the times in Northern Ireland, the story goes that there was a uh, you know a, a, a band of men. There was a fellow walking down the street, and they jumped him, and they said to him, "Are you Protestant or Catholic?" And the guy says, "Neither. I'm Jewish." So he said, "Are you Protestant or Catholic?" He says, "I'm neither. I'm Jewish." Are you a Protestant Jew or a Catholic Jew? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so unfortunately, we find that reality often shows its face in, in, in Jews being caught in the middle because they're the minority uh, in, in good part of the world uh, and, and suffered a result of it. Uh, and even today, you know, either Jews are a minority, in which case they have to deal with the uh, right wing, uh, you will not replace us. If you remember down in, in, in uh, Virginia, Virginia, uh, Virginia, Virginia, Charlottesville, or they're part of the white oppressors because Jews are all white, aren't we? <laughs> no, <laughs> but there's uh, there's some uh, young ladies I saw online, uh, not just women, but uh, uh, Ethiopian Jews who are trying to to mind the world, and not every Jew looks like a Northern European. As a matter of fact, they're less more than European than many. <laughs> anyway, all right. So next week we actually will be finishing up Sefer uh, Bereshit. And uh, the, the end of the story. I'm sorry? Next week or next class. Uh, next class. This Shabbos is what I just talked about, Vayigash. And the following week, correct, Conrad, uh, is when we will uh, finish up uh, Safer and Preshit. Thank you for that correction. All right. It's time to go back to our Hebrew.
we we were up to the vav on page thirty four. Okay. Okay. I, I know it's been a few weeks already, and everybody's forgotten all the Hebrew they learned. Hope oh, not. <laughs> we did the Shin and Shabbat, right? Page 31. Everybody remember? If you recognize it, yes. We did it. So, yeah. yeah, we did the Shin and we did the Kof and the Dalid. All right. Yeah, so I guess we're up to page 34. Make sense? Yes. Anybody out there in, in Tiki land think, disagree? Mm -hmm. Nobody says anything, so I guess you're not disagreeing. Okay. That's fine. Fine. Okay. All right. So the letter Vav uh, is a, sometimes problematic. The reason for that is when it has a dot on top of it, it is an O vowel. Or most of the time it will be an O vowel. Okay. But when it's it's by itself, it's it's a it sounds like the V, the letter V. And so if there's a vowel underneath it, uh, like ah, it would be va. Now it happens that we know, and especially because of the relationship Hebrew and Arabic, then biblical times it was pronounced as a W, not a V. But some stage of history, it became a V sound, and that's how we look, uh, follow it till today. So it says it's the vav we're doing on uh, the bracha, the top of the page. Baruch atah Hashem elakenu melech olam, asher kidshanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu. So mitzvotav we have to deal with it uh, in on the next page. So right now we're just dealing with it as if it were the letter V. So line number one, we read. Va, va, ve, ve, v, v, o, ve, o, or vo. Okay, I'm my my mistake. We should read that as vo right now. Okay, vo. Okay, we'll explain more as I say. We get the next page. Line number two. Vav, vu, vo. Va sav siva ho ve. All right, line number three. Ve kam va ten ve ha dag ve ha tur va ad. Four. Rava revach. Roveach Vilu Five Vilachats Vati ten Vihotsi Vilon Six Viter Vihule Vatrani Viha Ove. Not seven. Vada ut. Vador. Uf rots. Okay. Now, the word mitzvah, you see the top of the next page, right? You see under the letter vav, the a uh, vowel, the komats. Okay. So that's why we pronounce it mitz. Va. Now the word, the plural form of mitzvah, really should be spelled with two vavs. Mitzvot or mitzvot. But instead of that, the letter vav with a dot over, since there's no other vowel with it, you can't start a syllable with a vowel sound, it must mean the vav is serving two purposes. It's serving the purpose as the letter consonant vav and as the indicator of the vowel o. Now, how are we supposed to know that? We know that 
by learning the following. Look at the vowel in the letter just before the vav of mitzvot. That's a shva. Okay? When you have a word, which is not very frequent, in which the preceding syllable ends with the, 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 the shva, it's mitz, right? The previous syllable is mitz. The shva is to tell you that's the end of the syllable. Now you have another syllable. Syllables in Hebrew must always begin with a consonantal sound. So therefore, per force, it is meets vote. Now, if that were the word for matzah, you would have matzot. But the that's because the mem has a komatz under it. And the tzadi that comes next is attached to the next uh, next uh, vowel sound. Mi, ma, sa, matza, matzot. There's no shva involved. Okay? So we read mitzvot as if it were spelled with two vavs. Now, modern Israeli spelling will often take note of that kind of thing and may indeed put in two vavs to make it easier, because Israelis don't normally learn the nikud, the vowel signs that we use. They just learn to read Hebrew somehow without those little dots and dashes that we're getting so used to. And if you pick up a traditional rabbinic text, they never have vowels in it. Okay. So we have uh, we have mitzvot there at the sort of the middle of the page, and commanded us the si va nu. There's a komatz under the vav. The si va nu. You can't well, you, you can't have any. You have to have a consonant before the vowel. So the vav has to be the consonant vav there. Then the next one, b meets votav. You have the end of the syllable, meets. Now you have a new syllable. Syllable must begin with a vowel sign sound. So it's got to be meets votav. Is that clear as mud to everybody? Right, it, there's no, you just have to memorize that reality. It's just a rule you have to, to learn. You're not going to come across it a lot. But the word mitzvah is an important word. You're going to see it all the time. What does the word mitzvah mean? Commandment. Alone. Commandment. Remember, if any rabbi on a bay din asks you what does the word mitzvah mean, what are you going to tell him or her? Commandment. Commandment. Okay, thank you. Don't let them think the Rabbi Berman taught you the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's read the bracha for lighting the Shabbat candles. That's uh, towards the bottom of the page. Okay, together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Ishanu the meets votav vitzivanu lehadlik der shel shabbat. Okay. So now you know how to read the bracha. So this Friday night, when the candles are lit, make sure you have this blessing in front of you. And if you're not doing it, say it with them, <laughs> reading it out of the book. That's one of the best ways to learn it. If 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 you're not real comfortable with it, you hear it being spoken or said, and you're reading it along with them, then you, you know, it, it certainly helps. So I in shul, even if you're not keeping up completely with the prayers, but especially when something be done out loud, if you can find it in the sea door to hear it and, and compare it to the word in front of you, it makes the learning a lot easier. And so these are some important words. Lahadlik means to kindle to, to light. 
Lahadlik means by light, I mean to set something, turn something on, to kindle it. Not it's the light load. Okay. You know, that's the problem with English. You know, the word light can mean two different things, totally different. Nair, it, it can be a candle, it can be a lamp. A nair is any illuminating uh item, really. Usually a candle or a lamp. Most of the time people translate it as a candle. Shell of Shabbat. Everybody knows what Shabbat is, right? How many days a week does Shabbat fall? Once. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's turn over to page 37. Okay, we have review. And all of these now are real words. Not necessary words you're going to find in the prayer book, or even in the Bible, but they are all genuine words. All right? Line number one. Meets, be meets, vote, be meets, vote, tav. Well, I, I stand correct in all these are words. These are syllables for some of the words. <laughs> Line number two. Tav be meets bo tav v'tsivanu lehadlik tav. Line three. Luach luchot kerach Kedem. 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 Right? The double sego. Kedem. Line number four. Sarut. Oh, he's going to. Oh, okay. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> line number. All right. Line number four again. Sarut. Sriach. Sricha. Srif. So Rech Moshe. Now we came across that before, right? The dot can sometimes serve for both. Lots and lots of books today that have Nikud in them will put in two dots now. Make your life a lot easier. Line number five. Makif Kuf Shelcha Litakane. Tikum Taraf. Line number six. Kodesh Shedi Bear Degel Rodef Sedek Tirdof. Line number seven. Dagan Dodi Dodech. Do da yich, do re nu, da ka. Line eight. Serif, sherika, sharach, sheretz, shtaim. Anybody have any idea what shrika is? What does it sound like it might be? Shrika. Um, it's a whistle. Oh, Shrika. Shrika. Just, you know, because it's, it's onomatopoeia. Shrika. Shrika. Okay. Line number nine. Yishta. Yisharta. Yishtok. Yirkod. Rikud. Ten. Shema. Echad. Adonai, Adonai, Yiye, Shaddai. Now, I have to apologize. I will often say the name of God in, in, in both ways. I grew up with the ah uh, sound originally, so Adonai is how I will often pronounce it. In the Sephardic pronunciation, it should be more of an I at the end, Adonai. Right? There's uh, basically no difference because it has the same vowel here in uh, when we're praying, if that's the vowel for it. Uh, but it, I, I mentioned it before that in the Bible, 
when there's there's a kamatz, that's referring to uh, the word Adonai, with a kamatz, would be referring to God. Aleph dalad nun vav yud dalad vav nun yud with a uh, with a patach would be human a human being, my lord, my master. Okay, the letter tet. Uh, now, remember, we had the Tav that has really two versions, with and without a dot. We make no distinction in Sephardic pronunciation of the Hebrew between the two Ts. Originally, there was a distinction. There is no longer, a, uh, a, a, except maybe in uh, Yemenite Jews. Originally, the Tav without the dot in it was a TH. Uh, so that for example, I know my daughter lied to me about this the other day. You've heard about the Houthi rebels in Yemen? Houthi, as mm -hmm. well, it's spelled TH. They're not Houthi, but Houthi. Uh, Hebrew doesn't have a TH anymore. All right? There's no TH in Hebrew. All right? It is either hard T, is in Sardic pronunciation, or it's the S in Ashkenazi's pronunciation. But it was originally a TH, and that's still preserved in the Arabic and in some Jewish communities from uh, Yemen that would say it. Okay, but the Tet is always a T. The, it, if you have dots in it, it doesn't matter. Dots sometimes mean doubling up of letters, but it's always a T. You can never make a mistake on the letter tab, tet, that it will always be the T sound. Okay? So we're working on the blessing we, for Shabbat we did. Now we're going to learn blessing for Yom Tov. Because it's got a tab, uh, tet. I'm going to be doing that all night long. <laughs> it has a tet, which is the ninth letter of the Hebrew alphabet uh, in it. Okay, tov. Tov means what? Good, good. Okay, very good. Okay, that'd be tov mode, actually. Line number one. Ta, ta, te, te, ti, t, to. Line number two. To, te, tai, mi, ta, tur, chait. Line three. Ta am, ta har, ta bur, ta bach, ta me, ta rath. Line four. Beterem, te roof, til tul, le tal tel, le tal fame. Line number five. Ra tuf. Patar Anak Matana Chotem. Six. Tinoket Rachok Shuta Talya Matbea. Okay. So let's. Uh, Finish up on the next page so we can have the whole bracha for Yom Tov. When's the next Yom Tov? When is the next holiday where we say this bracha? Um, Nisan. What? We can't run? Nisan. Nisan? But what's the holiday? Um, it's the month. Um, um, Pesach. 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 Right. Yeah, the month, right? <laughs> Purim is different. You know, no, Purim is not. not we don't light candles for Purim. There is no. Candle line from Purim. Why? Because it's a festival. Oh, it's a holiday. It's a biblical holiday. Even it's not a Torah holiday. We can work. Yeah. We can cook. So the a Yom Tov, you're not allowed to to work. You can cook for that day if necessary. Right. So uh, in Shabbat. You're not supposed to light candles at all. And you don't tell you're allowed to transfer flame, but you don't light it. So we have to have a light to start the holiday walk so we can see what we're doing. Okay. So now we've had the letter bet with the dot in it. Now is the letter bet without the dot. Vet. 
right? as I said before, the difference between these certain letters is the air stop. B, you put your lips together, B. If you try to say B, but don't quite get your lips together, what do you get? Uh, there's the vet. So the difference between bet and vet is whether or not your lips actually get together. Either whether you kiss yourself or not. Right? So without the dot, it's a vet, a V sound. Okay. Uh, so line number one. Vo, v, 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 v. Line number two. Lave, levav, rav, chalav, halev, nadav, dov. Line number three. Hever. Boker, Shahar, Shave, Shakul. Four, Rove, Bore, Shuva, Shovavut, Meet Bach. Line five, Badavar, Mivrak, Havraka. Ir Bev Rachav six Le Havdil Havdala Hebdel Shavua To. Now, just to finish with this. Now, the, the letters that have, have dots in to tell us their air stops are referred to as Begid Kefet, Bet, Gimel, Dalit, Kaf, Pei, and Tav. We don't uh, make that distinction much with some of the letters. Right? Begid, B, Bet, and Vet. Gimel, we don't make that distinction. Uh, Dalit, we don't make that distinction. Kaf and Chaf, Pei and Fe, and again, Tav, we don't. But you, what you will see is that when there's a letter that is one way or the other, with or without a dot, that's the normal form of it. It almost will never, it will never be a beginning of a word standing alone. You cannot have a vet at the beginning of a word standing by itself. Only if there's a vowel sound preceding it in the in the last word. Uh bene. B. Vene, u vene, u, the vowel sound, vene, u vene means and the children of, vene, children of, u vene, and the children of. Uh, I'm just trying to think of one off the uh, head and I can't, uh, right? Well, uh, but often, when it has a dot in it at the beginning of the word, and then you add a vowel sound to it in that same word as uvene, the dot drops out. All right. All right. We will stop here for the evening. So we got to the tov part all the way for our uh, blessing for Yom Tov, and we'll start with a review next week. Okay. Now, before uh, missing last week's class, we had started talking about the Bible, started talking about Genesis, and I did go into Exodus as well. So uh, we need to pick up a little bit from Vayikra, Leviticus, and then on to uh, the last books of the Torah. Remember, we, there is in Jewish tradition a clear distinction between the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and the rest of Tanakh, the rest of the Hebrew Bible. That's because, at least according to some of the descriptions in the Torah, and according to rabbinic Jewish tradition, the Torah was given by God to Moses at Sinai. Somehow, there's a difference of opinion exactly how that transpired, 
But the tradition is that that is the holiest part portion of the Tanakh. Uh, and if we talk about Jewish law, most of the time we're going to refer to what's mentioned in the Torah as at least as the beginning. Occasionally something in the prophets, but that's unusual. Uh, and similarly with Ketuvim, the writings. Uh, and we call it, the different names given to it is Torah Moshe, the Torah of Moses, Chamisha Chumshe Torah, the five fifths of the Torah, because there are five books in the Torah, uh, are Torah. Right. So Genesis is mostly uh, uh, stories. They're not considered to be any real mitzvot in Genesis. Exodus, well, it starts off with a narrative and the story of Egypt. It eventually gets into very clearly legal information. Uh, I may have mentioned it two weeks ago when we read in the Torah, uh, ayin tachat ayin, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. The rabbis understood that to mean monetary restitution. Not that we literally take out an eye if you put out somebody else's eye. The Code of Hammurabi, which is even earlier, according to most historians, has a legal version of that, a literate, uh, uh, yeah, liter literal version of that. So that it says if a man builds a house, a builder, and the owner of the house, it collapses on the owner's daughter, killing her. The daughter of the builder is executed. Eye for an eye. Okay. The other parallels and distinctions between some of the other codes, but we the, it's fascinating to see and try and deal with how the biblical version of it is versus the external version and if there's a relationship or not. That's up to the academicians to try and figure that all out. So up until about, uh, we read in, in Shemot, say for Shemot Exodus, we read about the Exodus. We read about the giving of the Torah at Sinai. We read about uh, the various mishpatim uh, laws of, of everyday life. That's in, in the Parsha of Mishpatim, chapters 22, 3, etc. Then the rest of the book of Exodus is concerned with the construction of the tabernacle. The tabernacle is to be the portable home, as it were, of God when Israel is wandering through the wilderness. And it is the pattern for the temple in Jerusalem that King Solomon builds and later on is in during the second temple that is built. Now, Biblical critics might reverse the role. They might say that Solomon's temple or the temple that existed during the first and second temple periods was the paradigm for the tabernacle. Then the tabernacle was based upon it because they don't accept the historicity of the account of Exodus. So be aware of, of those two different approaches. Say for Vayikra, Leviticus, you know, the names I mentioned before, the names in Jewish tradition are usually one of the first or first significant word in that passage. So that the word, the name for the first book of the Bible, as well as the first Torah portion, is Breshit, because that's the very first word in the Torah. In English, the names derive from the Septuagint, which followed a different pattern, which was to name uh, books based upon content. Okay. So what is the first book of the Bible in English? Genesis. Genesis, because it tells the beginning. Beginning of the earth, the beginning of the Jewish people. Uh, I, I assume they extended all the way to that. Sefer Shmot. Eil Shemot B'nei Yisrael. These are the names of the children of Israel. 
So Shmot is the name it has in Hebrew. In English, Exodus, from the Latin, leading out, lead out. Ex, uh, is, is Latin for leader. I, so I believe Exoducus is what it comes from. I could be wrong there. But Exodus means to go out. And we use that way in English today, that there's an Exodus. Huh? The third book of the Torah, Vayikra, again, because it opens up Vayikra, Elohim, Moshe. God calls out to Moshe. Elohim or Hashem. Vayikra, El Moshe. Doesn't even have the name of God there at all. Good for me. Right? Fascinating, by the way. Vayikra. Uh, is spelled Vav, Yud, Kuf, Resh, Aleph. All letters that you guys have all learned. Now, in uh, some letters in the Bible have certain special rules for them. And one of those is that the last letter of the word Vayikra, the Aleph, is written small. It's smaller and, and it stands up above the line. Uh, the top of it is even with the top line, but it's smaller, hanging down from there. I believe that's right. Uh, or is it on the bottom? Okay. Matters not. But it's, it's a different size. Why? Why should that be? So there, you know, can have all kinds of attempts to explain it. The rabbi said that Vayikra, he called out, he summoned, is how God speaks to Moses, speaks to a prophet, he calls out to him. And it's, it's a statement that's honor to summon, call him. It, uh, there's another word in Hebrew, Vayikar, it, you know, comes across. It was by chance. And Moshe didn't want to, he's the humblest of all human beings ever on the earth, according to the rabbis. Torah itself says he's a humble man. He wanted to, to leave out the olive. And God says, no, you got to put the olive in, Vayikra. So you read it correctly. So Moses says, what can I do? He put it in, but he made it smaller. <laughs> His humility. Now, that leads up to the fact that Vayikra is called in English Leviticus. Leviticus means with the priests, priestly order, priestly things. Because most of Leviticus is concerned with matters that would uh, concern the priests. It starts off with a whole list of sacrifices that are offered for certain circumstances. And it's very important to understand the meaning of a sacrifice. Now, uh, there are those who might see in this concept sacrifice a, a, a concept that you are feeding a deity. Somehow the deity eats that sacrifice. And that certainly underlies the, the probably the, the creation, the concept sacrifice, although even in uh, Latin, it means to make holy. Uh, but it becomes change in the biblical understanding of it. Because God, being non-corporeal, doesn't eat. And even in just burning up, it uses language, God smells the fragrant aroma, but that's just to say that God is conscious of the sacrifice. It's not saying that God ate it. So that the the parts that are burned, uh, sometimes the entire animal would be burnt. Sometimes only certain parts of the animal was burnt. Sometimes the parts that were not burnt were consumed by the priests. Sometimes parts that were not consumed on the altar or by the priests were eaten by the person who brought it. And in that way, it becomes like a holy meal that you are sharing, as it were, with God. 
And we also know that in the ancient world in general, people did not eat much meat. One of the few times that they ate meat was when the animal was brought as a sacrifice. Uh, cattle were raised for uh, locomotion, to pull a plow, to pull a wagon. Uh, they weren't even uh, for dairy cattle in those days. Dairy was from goats and sheep, who were also used for their their wool and their their uh, uh, as well as their their milk. Uh, and sometimes they were consumed. Beef was very rare because when are you going to kill your major mo mo means of transportation or plowing your field? Mm -hmm. And that lasted quite a while. The Talmud is very concerned. And when, when the Talmud talks about accidents, you know, we talk about a car biting into another car. What is the Talmud uh, that we're on right now when we're studying in the Talmud? Shor, not shenagach shor, an ox that gored another ox. Yeah. What's the what's the law? What happens there? You know, it's no no fault insurance in in those days. Okay. So it it remained until the close to the modern era, when cattle began to be more uh, raised for beef consumption. So the sacrifices that are listed are not only important because it's not seen as. Uh, really feeding God, but it is a way of honoring God. My, uh, Maimonides suggests that a sacrifice is in lieu of the person. You yourself, if you did something wrong, you yourself would be guilty. You yourself should perhaps die for that sin. So in a, instead, an animal is sacrificed in your place. That's one way of understanding it. But uh, we start off by talking about voluntary offerings that were brought. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually say that, though. The Torah doesn't say it. It says, uh, when any of you presents an offering of cattle to the Lord, he shall choose his offering from the herd or from the flock. So I already see we're talking about a large animal, but not necessarily cattle. If, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall make his offering a male without blemish. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. One way of looking at it, uh, in the ancient world, males took priority. I'm took, you know, patriarchies and everything like that. I don't deny that. But also, how many male animals do you need for a herd? One or two. More than one or two, and you're having fighting over the females. One or two can take care of the female. So what's the easiest animal really to get rid of as a sacrifice? I'm just saying that's that's an underlying reality that's there would be male. So most of the sacrifices are male animals. Not all, but most. All right. So uh, it has to be without blemish. You're not going to give something to God that doesn't look right and missing a leg. Or, or or an ear or what have you. It's got to be an animal that looks decent. He brings it to the tent of meeting for acceptance on his behalf before the Lord. He shall lay his hand upon the head of the burnt offering that may be acceptable in his behalf in expiation for him, in, in uh, atonement for him. The so Kaparalov. So it's a, he wants to gain some sense of atonement from this offering. Uh and then slaughter before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall offer the blood, dashing the blood against all sides of the altar, which is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The rabbi see in the language here says it shall be slaughtered before the Lord. Only then does it say, and Aaron's pre Aaron's sons, the priests, shall offer the blood. So it was understood that any male, theoretically even a female, but practically just a male a man could slaughter his own sacrifice. But the catching of the blood and sprinkling it on the altar all had to take place, be done by the priests. The burnt offering shall be flayed and cut up in sections, and sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire on the altar and lay out wood upon the fire. 
And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall lay out the sections with the head and the suet on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. His entrails and legs shall be washed with water, and the priest shall turn the whole into smoke on the altar as a burnt offering, an offering by fire, a pleasing odor to the Lord. Okay, so that's the basic ritual. Then it goes on to talk about uh, from the flock, sheep or goats. Again, it's got to be male. Again, it's, it's the same procedure. Uh, then comes birds. If his offering is burnt offering of birds, he has to choose it between from either turtle doves or pigeons. And there's a whole argument what those two words really mean. In this case, the priest shall bring it to the altar, pinch off its head, and turn it into smoke on the altar. There's a special way of doing it. We're not going to go into it, but it's all done by the priest. And then finally, at, at the beginning of chapter two, it says, when a person offers an offering of meal to the Lord, flour, his offering shall be of choice flour. And it goes and describes how it's to be brought. It's interesting. Look, think of what we've got. We start off with cattle. Then we're talking about sheep and goats. Then we're talking about birds. And then we're talking about meal offering. Who would you think brings the meal offering? The poor. They can't afford any more than that. So again, the rabbi's sensitive to the language. Because it says in Hebrew, the nefesh ki takriv. Now the English translates it as when a person brings, which is a legitimate translation. But the word nefesh also can mean soul, life. Sorry about that. So when a soul brings, the, the rabbi said, when a poor man brings an offering, it's like he's giving his own soul to God. And, and his offering is just as worthy as the offering brought by the rich man. If the rich man who could afford, who could afford cattle as his offering brings a meal offering, there's something wrong. And you're not judged upon how big your offering is, but the sincerity of your offering. If that's all you can afford, it's just as good as anybody else. You know, in the world of fundraising, we play all kinds of games. The more you give, the greater honor is because that's what people look for. In an ideal world, people will give what they can afford to give because they want to give it. And you wouldn't have to have names on buildings and things like that. Right? So anyway, so then uh, it goes through various different kinds of offerings that were brought as sacrifices uh, to God. Later on, we have the listing of the kosher animals. That's found in Leviticus. We already read that when we talked about kosher, so I will skip over that. We then go into an area that's very uh, difficult to completely understand, and that's uh, what we call Tazriya Mitzorah. Uh, in the biblical world, there are things that are considered by nature to be pure, tahor, and things that by nature are considered to be tameh, impure. Uh, blood uh, of a dead person or a dead person are the height of impurity. And um, when you uh, have certain kinds of bodily emissions that you uh, impure ritually, and you have to go through a process of purification. One of the parts of that is the mikvah, which we'll talk about in the spring. But there's another thing that is mentioned, and it is Mitzorah. Now, Mitzorah is often translated as leprosy. Okay? But we know that the description of this whole uh, circumstance of a person having sara'at, leprosy, is not what is called today Hansen's disease. Hansen's disease is what used to refer to as leprosy. 
you know, where the body gets, the you know, your flesh comes off, your fingers come off, horrible things. Uh, this is something totally different. Is apparently curable or can pass away, disappear. And so as long as you show signs of it, you're ritually impure. When those signs disappear, you go then through a ritual of purification. So the rabbis, again, what's going on with this very strange thing? Because it also can be found on houses. A house can become leprous, which makes no sense if it's leprosy. So the rabbis point out that later in uh, the book of Numbers, uh, Miriam and Aaron speak ill of their brother Moses, Moshe. And as punishment, uh, Miriam is, is said to become leprous. And she has to wait seven days until the leprosy disappears, which is the normal clean days that you have after leprosy, the so-called leprosy. So why did she get the leprosy? Because she spoke ill of another person. In Hebrew, Lashon Hara. Or you may have heard more familiar with this, Lashon Hayra. You spoke Lashon Hayra about the guy. Lashon Hara. It means to, to gossip. It means to say bad things without any real purpose, legitimate purpose. You're not supposed to speak ill of people. And what the rabbis point out, so what happens when you speak ill of people? People, eventually you, you scare people away. They don't want to have anything to do with you. If you're going to talk back about them, you know, what, what was it? Uh, mean girls kind of stuff. So nobody wants to come near you. What happens when you have leprosy? No one wants to come near you. So they you put the two together and say, this is all a punishment for speaking ill, for Lashon Hara. Uh, we also have in Leviticus uh, some of the laws dealing with uh, permitted and forbidden sexual relations, incest laws uh, uh, and that sort. Uh, under the basic rubric of Kadoshin to you, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So the purpose of the mitzvot is to make us into a holy nation. And, and uh, that underlies all of this that we find throughout uh, Leviticus. Uh, the Midbar literally means in the wilderness. And again, it begins by the Be'er Shem El Moshe B'midbar Sinai. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. Right. And so, again, takes its name in Hebrew from uh, the opening line, opening, one of the opening words. In English, numbers, numera. Because there are a couple of times, and right at the very beginning, there's a census of the people of Israel. Uh, the rabbis say whenever something goes bad or there has a problem, there's always a census. And there's a list of all, so there's a listing of all the tribes and the numbers of the members of the tribe and all of that. Uh, it's one of those very, very thrilling readings. Uh, and then it describes how they camped around when they set up camp with the tabernacle in the middle, the Levites around it, the 12 tribes, three tribes on each side, each side of the square. Thus, that was how they would encamp. And when they marched off, they followed in a, an order. It's it's a picture of an army marching through the wilderness. But when we read the full account, of the, they mostly encamped. They spent more time camping than they spent marching. When you really go through it, you see most of the time is really spent uh, in these camps. And that's where we find the story of, of, of Miriam and, and Aaron speaking against Moses. Then we have an episode that is 
unfamiliar to many people. Uh, in chapter 13, God tells Moses, uh, if you uh, literally, the English says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to scout the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to these white people. Send one man from each of their ancestral tribes, each one a chieftain among them. You know, the rabbis have a hard time with this particular line because of what happens afterwards. And some are suggesting that it wasn't really a command by God. He says, if you want to do it, do it. <laughs> uh, because what happens, these 12 men, one from each of the tribes, 10 of them come back and say to Moses, yeah, it's a wonderful country, but it's got big giants there. And we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. And there's ain't no way we're going to be conquer them. It just is not going to happen. And um, when, uh, when they give this report after all of that, the people get very upset. Uh, let me find the lines. All the people we saw in it are men of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The Anakites are part of the Nephilim. And we look like grasshoppers to ourselves, and so we must have looked to them. Interesting. First, they saw themselves as grasshoppers. And only after that did the men see them as grasshoppers. There's a, there's a wonderful bit of uh, uh, sermonizing in that idea. First, you see yourself in the wrong way, and then others will see you in the wrong way. How you see yourself is how people are going to see you. All right, so they started crying, the people, and they wept, and the Israel ra railed against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in the land of Egypt, the whole community shouted at them. Or if only we might die in this wilderness. Why is the Lord taking us to that land to fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be carried off. It would be better for us to go back to Egypt. And they said to one another, let us head back for Egypt. After all the great miracles, all the things that have taken place. Uh, uh, and so Moses and Aaron, they, they, they don't really know what to say. They fall on their face in front of the people. And Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Yephunah, of those who scoured the land, rent their clothes and exhorted the holy Israelite community. The, these two of all the 12 spies said, wait a minute. Don't, don't get excited. The land we traverse and scouted is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into that land, a land that flows with milk and honey, and give it to us. Only you must not rebel against the Lord. Have no fear then of the people of the country, for they are our prey. Their protection is departed from them, but the Lord is with us. Have no fear of them. So, Yoshua, Joshua, and Caleb, and Caleb say, you know, if, if God is, wants us to conquer that, we can do it. Just don't rebel against him. Uh, uh, but then, then the, the, as the whole community uh, threatened to pelt them with stones, the presence of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. So God's got to step in. Uh, and here is where 40 years in the wilderness comes into being because they lost heart because they were willing to talk about going back to Egypt and rebelling against God God says how long shall the wicked community keep muttering against me uh, lines later say them as I live says the Lord I will do to you just as you've urged me in this very wilderness shall your carcasses drop. Of all you who were recorded in your various lists from the age of 20 years up, you have muttered against me. Not one shall enter the land which I swore to settle you, save Caleb, son of Yifunah, and Yehoshua ben Nun. Your children, who you said would be carried off, these will I allow to enter. They shall know that the land that you have rejected but your carcasses shall drop in the wilderness while your children warm, while your children roam the wilderness for 40 years, suffering for your faithfulness since the last of your carcasses is down in the wilderness. 
because they lost heart, God's not going to sudden destroy them. He's going to say, you're going to die off. Everybody who was from the age of 20 on when they left Egypt are, are going to die. So the next 40 years, well, actually, it's about 38 years at this point, because they've already been there for two years. Well, the battery's getting low. I know it's going to happen. Um, so uh, that's the 40-year punishment. In those days, you know, 60 was getting along in years for to, to many people in that day and age. And so they would die out in the Midbar. The Midrash, the rabbi said what they did was they would dig their grave every night and sleep in their grave. And in the morning, if they got up, they were fine. If they didn't get up, then they filled in the grave for the person who was there. Until on one morning, nobody stayed in. Must be, it's okay now. All right. The last book, uh, Sefer Devarim, Deuteronomy. Oh, no, no, I, I just can't skip this part. Balak, Chukat and Balak. Anybody ever hear of Bilam? Yes. Anybody hear of the famous talking donkey? Yes. All right. So Bilam is a prophet of the Gentiles. He's described that way. He said whatever he uh, prophesies comes to be. And uh, Balak sends for him to curse Israel. And when it first comes in, and Bilam says, I can't do anything unless God lets me. So God appears to him in a dream that night, says, what's going on? He says, these guys have invited me to come with them. God says, no, stay here. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. So they go back to, to, to Balak, and Balak says, okay, I'll well, send some more money. Send some more gifts. So once again, Bilam says, I got to see what God says. And basically God is saying, look, you really know what I want. And if you really, he doesn't, you know, again, paraphrase, you're really smart, you won't go with them. But if you want to go with them, go with them. What am I going to do? It's like a parent says to a child sometimes, you know, you really want to, you know what's right, but if that's what you're going to do, all right. So the story goes that he saddles his ass and they're the one he's had for years and years, and they go off. <laughs> and all of a sudden he's alone. And the the there's an angel of God blocking the way, and the animal tries to avoid it, and he tries to avoid it another time, and he pushes up against the wall, and then Billam's leg is crushed against the wall, and Billam starts to beat him. And they and, and the <coughs> then it says, uh when the ass now saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Billam. And Billam was furious and beat the ass with his stick. By the way, it's spelled B-A-L-A-A-M. So you mostly hear it read by people who don't know Hebrews, Balaam. The Bilaam is the correct Hebrew. Uh, then the Lord opened the ass's mouth and she said to Bilaam, what have I done to you that you beat me these three times? Bilaam said to the ass, you have made a mockery of me. If I had a sword with me, I'd kill you. The ass said to Bilaam, look, I am the ass you've been riding all along until this day. Have I been in the habit of doing thus to you? And he answered, no. Then the Lord uncovered Bilaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, his drawn sword in his hand, whereupon he bowed right down to the ground. Okay, so you have this, this story. How do you relate to it? Uh, there are those who take it literally. There's even a statement in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers, that suggests that there were 10 things created on uh, the last day of creation, just before Shabbat began, and one of them was Bilaam's ass. Maimonides, as is his want, prefers to see this as a dream. And all the elements there are there of a dream. He's, where, where's everybody when he's meeting up with this angel? All of a sudden, he's not part of the whole party, the whole group. And that's the Rambam Maimonides' general attitude, is that if and when he can, anything that seems beyond normative possibility, there, he let, there are miracles. But if there's a way of explaining something in a more normative way, Maimonides prefers to do that. So he prefers to see this as a dream. And that God is mentioned frequently as consorting, consulting 
with prophets and dreams. So that's how he wants to take it. Uh, so Bilaam goes to Balak. Balak says, what do you want you to do? He says, build an altar. And he builds some altars, make sacrifices. And when Bilaam gets up to curse Israel, all he can say is good things. And Bilaam says, Balak says to Bilaam, what are you doing? I came here, brought you here to curse them, not to praise them. Uh, let's try again. Go to another spot. Same thing happens. Goes to another spot. Same thing happens. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and Bilaam says to Balak, what did I tell you? All I could say is what God lets me say. What do you want from me? Uh, uh, enraged at Bala, Bilaam, Balak struck his hands together. I called you, Balak said to Bilaam, to damn my enemies. And instead you've blessed them these three times. Back with you at once to your own place. I was going to reward you richly, but the Lord has denied you the reward. Bill replied to Balak, but I even told the messengers you sent me, though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not of my own accord do anything good or bad contrary to the Lord's command. What the Lord says, that I must say. So he then prophesies what's going to happen to everybody else around. He's not a good guy. He gets he suggests some things to the Midianites later on, and he gets killed in a battle. Uh, Billam. Uh, but that is the important story there. And one other, there's always one other, never <laughs> enough time to do it. Uh, towards, uh, in chapter 27, we're taught about dividing up uh, the land amongst the, the people of Israel. Uh, they make a census and the land is going to be divided uh, uh According to the families, it is all male lineage. The daughters of Slovchad of the Mas uh, the Masonite family from Manasseh, excuse me, Manassite family, uh, gives them their names, and they uh, are. They say to Moses, "Our father died in the wilderness. He was not one of the. He didn't do anything wrong. He left no sons. Let our father's name not be lost to his clan just because he had no son. Give us." holding among father's kinsmen. So normally we see this throughout Jewish history up until the modern era. Uh, daughters normally did not uh, inherit their fathers or their mothers for that matter, for the most part, uh, unless there were no sons. If there were no sons, then the daughters could inherit their father's estate. So the daughters of Slavchad, so, and, and Moses doesn't know what to answer them at that point. He goes to God and God says, yep. Yeah. And so it becomes the law that when there are no sons to inherit, the daughters inherit. But because that was a tribal world and lands were part of the tribal uh, possessions, uh, they had to marry men from their own tribe uh, to inherit the land. That, today, that doesn't matter. All right. Deuteronomy the fifth and final book of the Torah. It's called uh, Sefer Devarim, in, in, uh, or it is also called, sometimes referred to as Mishnah Torah. Sefer Devarim, or the book of number of Devarim, of words, because it says, Elo Devarim, Adevarim, Asher Diber Moshe El Yisrael. These are the words that Moses spoke to Israel. Uh, so Devarim is the second word there, so that's uh, the Hebrew name. The English name does have a an ancestry in another Hebrew name, Mishnah Torah, the re, re, second Torah, or the repetition of the Torah. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, second law. That's what Deuteronomy means, second telling of the law. It's called that because a lot of the laws seem to replicate, in to in some level, things found earlier in the Torah. Uh, Sometimes there's some differences, and the rabbis, I'll explain those differences, meant to teach us more about the law. We talked about that when we looked at the, uh, the story of the Aser Tadibrot, the Ten Commandments, how the wording is different in the two books. And the rabbinic attempt to do it. Um, we also find in Sefer Devarim, the Shema, 
the Vahaya in Shemoa paragraph. Shema Yisrael Hashem al Kain Hashem Echad. There is the Lord of God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might, with all your might and all your soul. Okay, that we repeat daily. In the second paragraph, which is found elsewhere, if you listen to God's words, you will be rewarded. If not, you're going to be punished. Uh, this is found in Devarim. A number of items are found in Devarim that are not found elsewhere. Uh, popular biblical critics uh, want to say that it's a separate work. There's a famous story recorded in uh, the book of Kings uh, that King Josiah, Yoshiahu, who was one of the last kings of Judah, he, he is killed, I think it's 605 BCE. Uh, during his reign, a book, they were repairing the temple and a book was found and they read from the book and they discovered they hadn't been doing things right. And they had a, one, had a special Passover that year, following all the rules and regulations found in Deuteronomy and found there. And so they want to say this parallels Deuteronomy. So they want to say that Deuteronomy at least came into no, general no, knowledge during the reign of King Josiah, that, based upon that. Uh, take it or leave it. Okay. Uh, according to uh, the oldest form of biblical criticism, the priestly document, the priestly aspect of the Torah, which was a lot of Leviticus, was the last thing composed. Uh, one of the modern uh, scholars, Yechezkel Kaufman, says, no, Deuteronomy was the last. So he puts the priestly aspect of it much earlier in Israelite history. So either it's one unit, the tr Jewish tradition, are its different parts uh, with different voices, as as uh, a fellow I like to listen to on one of the podcasts will say, uh, to explain the differences. But remember, as I said before, the rabbis are all very much aware of any of these contradictions or difficulties. They, moreover, sought to explain them in a manner that would allow us to retain the unity of the Torah. So for rabbinic tradition, it, the Torah is the Torah of Moses. There were some rabbis who wanted to say the last few lines in the book of Deuteronomy didn't come from the hands of Moses. Why? In the last chapter. When Moses went up from the steps of Moab to Mount Nebo to the summit of Pisgah opposite Jericho, the Lord showed him the whole land. Da, 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 da. I will sign it to your offspring and I will let you see it with your own eyes but you shall not cross there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the command of the Lord. He, meaning God, buried him in the valley in the land of Moab near Bet Peor. No one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were undimmed, his vigor unabated. And the Israelites bewailed Moses in the steps of Moab for 30 days. The period of wailing and mourning for Moses came to an end. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him and the Israelites heeded him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never again did there arise in Israel a prophet like Moses whom the Lord singled out face to face. For the very signs importance that the Lord sent him to display in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his courtiers and his whole country and for all the great might and awesome power that Moses displayed before all Israel. So it describes the death of Moses. It describes the people of Israel mourning him for 30 days. It describes Joshua taking over. So one rabbi said, Joshua wrote it. Joshua wrote the last verses of the book of uh, Deuteronomy. The other rabbi says, you know, God forbid. Moses wrote it with tears in his eyes. Rose, Moses wrote what was going to happen to him because he could not uh, count even a single letter or word not having been compiled by Moses. Right? So we clearly see a, a distinction between the five books of Moses and the rest of the Tanakh. The stories that come before uh, assume life either pre-Israelite uh, peoplehood 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or wandering in the wilderness up to the entry point to the land of Canaan. From Joshua on, the story is of the people of Israel in the land of Canaan. The story of the people of Israel with kings and fights and revolutions and revolts and all kinds of the human story that transpires. And furthermore, the understanding, as the tradition has, of this, that the nature of the book of the Torah is so much different in nature of the sanctity, whatever follows afterwards, because God gave the first five books, God inspired, God told prophets, different you know, kinds of things in the rest of it. Okay. So my, my computer says my battery is running low. And so it's a good point to stop. I made it just to the right moment. And next time, remember to plug it in as well. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, see everybody, God willing, next week. I was going to say something. You were going to say something. What would you like to say? Yes. The thing that he sought to bless, he really wanted it to be a curse. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, something.